respect for the other person's opinions. Never say, you're wrong. Within a minute's walk of my house there was a wild stretch of virgin timber, where the blackberry thickets foamed white in the springtime, where the squirrels nested and reared their young, and the horse weeds grew as tall as a horse's head. This unspoiled woodland was called Forest Park, and it was a forest, probably not much different in appearance from what it was when Columbus discovered America. I frequently walked in this park with Rex, my little Boston bulldog. He was a friendly, harmless little hound, and since we rarely met anyone in the park, I took Rex along without a leash or a muzzle. One day we encountered a mounted policeman in the park, a policeman itching to show his authority. What do you mean by letting that dog run loose in the park without a muzzle and leash? He reprimanded me. Don't you know it's against the law? Yes, I know it is, I replied softly, but I didn't think he would do any harm out here. You didn't think. You didn't think. The law doesn't give a tinker's damn about what you think. That dog might kill a squirrel or bite a child. Now, I'm going to let you off this time but if I catch this dog out here again without a muzzle and a leash, you'll have to tell it to the judge. I meekly promised to obey. And I did obey, for a few times. But Rex didn't like the muzzle, and neither did I, so we decided to take a chance. Everything was lovely for a while, and then we struck a snag. Rex and I raced over the brow of a hill one afternoon and there, suddenly, to my dismay, I saw the majesty of the law, astride a bay horse. Rex was out in front, heading straight for the officer. I was in for it. I knew it. So I didn't wait until the policeman started talking. I beat him to it. I said, officer, you've caught me red-handed. I'm guilty. I have no alibis, no excuses. You warned me last week that if I brought the dog out here again without a muzzle you would find me. Well, now, the policeman responded in a soft tone. I know it's a temptation to let a little dog like that have a run out here when nobody is around. Sure it's a temptation, I replied, but it is against the law. Well, a little dog like that isn't going to harm anybody, the policeman remonstrated. No, but he may kill squirrels, I said. Well now, I think you are taking this a bit too seriously, he told me. I'll tell you what you do. You just let him run over the hill there where I can't see him, and we'll forget all about it." That policeman, being human, wanted a feeling of importance, so when I began to condemn myself, the only way he could nourish his self-esteem was to take the magnanimous attitude of showing mercy. But suppose I had tried to defend myself, well, did you ever argue with a policeman? But instead of breaking lances with him, I admitted that he was absolutely right and I was absolutely wrong. I admitted it quickly, openly, and with enthusiasm. The affair terminated graciously in my taking his side and his taking my side. Lord Chesterfield himself could hardly have been more gracious than this mounted policeman, who, only a week previously, had threatened to have the law on me. If we know we are going to be rebuked anyhow, isn't it far better to beat the other person to it and do it ourselves? Isn't it much easier to listen to self-criticism than to bear condemnation from alien lips? Say about yourself all the derogatory things you know the other person is thinking or wants to say or intends to say, and say them before that person has a chance to say them. The chances are a hundred to one that a generous, forgiving attitude will be taken and your mistakes will be minimized just as the mounted policeman did with me and Rex Ferdinand E. Warren, a commercial artist, used this technique to win the goodwill of a petulant, scolding buyer of art. It is important, in making drawings for advertising and publishing purposes, to be precise and very exact, Mr. Warren said as he told the story. Some art editors demand that their commissions be executed immediately, and in these cases, some slight error is liable to occur. I knew one art director in particular who was always delighted to find fault with some little thing. I have often left his office in disgust, not because of the criticism, but because of his method of attack. Recently I delivered a rush job to this editor, and he phoned me to call at his office immediately. He said something was wrong. When I arrived, I found just what I had anticipated and dreaded. He was hostile, gloating over his chance to criticize. 
he demanded with heat why I had done so and so. My opportunity had come to apply the self-criticism I had been studying about. So I said, Mr. So and so, if what you say is true, I am at fault and there is absolutely no excuse for my blunder. I have been doing drawings for you long enough to know better. I'm ashamed of myself. Immediately he started to defend me. Yes, you're right, but after all, this isn't a serious mistake. It is only, I interrupted him. Any mistake, I said, may be costly and they are all irritating. He started to break in, but I wouldn't let him. I was having a grand time. For the first time in my life, I was criticizing myself, and I loved it. I should have been more careful, I continued. You give me a lot of work, and you deserve the best, so I'm going to do this drawing all over. No. No, he protested. I wouldn't think of putting you to all that trouble. He praised my work, assured me that he wanted only a minor change and that my slight error hadn't cost his firm any money, and, after all, it was a mere detail, not worth worrying about. My eagerness to criticize myself took all the fight out of him. He ended up by taking me to lunch, and before we parted, he gave me a check and another commission. There is a certain degree of satisfaction in having the courage to admit one's errors. It not only clears the air of guilt and defensiveness, but often helps solve the problem created by the error. Bruce Harvey of Albuquerque, New Mexico, had incorrectly authorized payment of full wages to an employee on sick leave. When he discovered his error, he brought it to the attention of the employee and explained that to correct the mistake he would have to reduce his next paycheck by the entire amount of the overpayment. The employee pleaded that as that would cause him a serious financial problem, could the money be repaid over a period of time? In order to do this, Harvey explained, he would have to obtain his supervisor's approval. And this I knew, reported Harvey, would result in a boss-type explosion. While trying to decide how to handle this situation better, I realized that the whole mess was my fault and I would have to admit it to my boss. I walked into his office, told him that I had made a mistake and then informed him of the complete facts. He replied in an explosive manner that it was the fault of the personnel department. I repeated that it was my fault. He exploded again about carelessness in the accounting department. Again I explained it was my fault. He blamed two other people in the office. But each time I reiterated it was my fault. Finally, he looked at me and said, okay, it was your fault. Now straighten it out. The error was corrected and nobody got into trouble. I felt great because I was able to handle a tense situation and had the courage not to seek alibis. My boss has had more respect for me ever since.